Welcome to the George W. Bush Institute webinar, Why Are Central Americans Fleeing Their Homes? My name is Matthew Rooney. I'm the Managing Director of the George W. Bush Institute SMU Economic Growth Initiative within uh, the framework of which this webinar takes place. We are working um, with a number of Central American partners in the context of our Central America Prosperity Initiative, Prosperity Project, which is an initiative to promote uh, policy reforms in Central, in, in Central America that will produce more robust economic growth with greater job creation. And we are joined today by uh, three members of our Central America Prosperity Project Working Group, which is a network of Central American thought leaders that we have brought together over the last three years to consider why the Central American economies don't grow more robustly and produce more job opportunities and to propose solutions uh, to, those, to those challenges, which, um, which we're gonna discuss in greater, uh, in greater length today. So we're joined by, uh, as I say, three members of our Central America Working Group. First, Claudia Umania, who's the Vice President of Fusales, a think tank in El Salvador. Maria Kalschmidt, co-founder and managing partner of Zen Interactive Media, and a board member of Fundesa, a think tank in Guatemala, and Guillermo Peña Panting, who is president and founder of the Fundación Eliutera, a think tank in San Pedro Sula, Honduras. So over the past decade or so, um, the nature of immigration to and across the south southwestern border of the United States has changed. For a number of decades, four decades or more, most intending immigrants crossing that border, uh, attempting to cross that border legally or illegally, were young Mexican men seeking employment in the United States. More recently, more and more of these migrants are families and frequently children traveling by themselves from the Northern countries of Central America, the so-called Northern Triangle of El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. With today's discussions, we wanna help our American audience better understand the reasons why so many people are seeking to leave those countries, the so-called push factors that are so hotly debated as the Biden administration develops its strategy for addressing the complex issues of immigration reform and border security. So let's all start. Welcome everyone and thank you for uh, joining us. The three of you, it's been such a pleasure uh, working with all of you over the last several years on this initiative and we're delighted that you're able to join us here today. Just give us a, just list um, in a few words, the top three, four, five factors uh, that you believe are, in, are motivating your fellow citizens to leave your countries. We'll start with um, Claudia because El Salvador comes first in alphabetical order. Thank you, Max, for the opportunity. Um, and it's a very important theme for us. So unfortunately, the push factors are violence. Um, I think also frustration. So uh, frustration with democracy, with not having good governance, also search for hope. And of course, you know, the, the great enemy, public corruption and weak rule of law. But in general, also having this aspiration to reunite also, because we have almost one third of our population already living in the United States, a little bit less of, than that, but it's a very important part of our social fabric. We're so intertwined with the United States. You know, it's always uh, one, of my, one of my facts that I like to keep in mind about El Salvador, I think is useful for Americans to keep in mind is that El Salvador is the country with the greatest proportion of its population living in the United States. A much larger proportion of immigrants in the United States are, are Mexican, but El Salvador is the country with the greatest proportion of its population living in the United States. It creates that community that you mentioned, Claudia. Maria, what factors do you think are driving Guatemalans to attempt to leave Guatemala? Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I, I'm really honored to be here and, and thank you everybody for connecting and, and caring about this really important um, um, subject as, as migration. It's, it's so important for, for the United States as it is um, for us. Um, yeah, I kind of hear Claudia and it resonates a lot with, uh, with Guatemala. Um, I think violence, um, it, it comes to my, my mind, the lack of security, you know, the gang related violence. People are feeling really threatened by, by gangs, by cartels. 
even my national authorities sometimes like I, I have to accept um, corruption definitely as, as Claudia said as Claudia mentioned um, at all levels in all sectors you know and and this is is also a push factor governance and rule of law definitely I mean it depends who you are in our countries and that's how the law is going to be applied to you and we have a totally collapsed justice system and um, you know where, where the state has failed to provide uh, justice and and we have in Guatemala, I think the, the impunity level goes to 90, 98, 99%. And that's obviously extremely high. Um, I'll, say, I'll say another one. I think one of the push factors is, I don't know how to put it in words. I think it's like a, the lack of a decent and, and dignified opportunities for, for people. When we talk about migrants, um, I think we're, we're talking about people who want to get paid fairly to, to, to you know, work in a proper condition and, and with their needs and rights being met. And that's something that we have failed to provide in our countries. And, and, and that's something that we really have to understand and humanize a little bit more, more the, the migration. And maybe I wanna end with, with climate change. I think in our countries, we're really vulnerable. I mean, Guatemala has been set, I don't know, very affected in the past years with a, a lot of natural hazards, including, including uh, you know, volcanic activity, hurricanes, landslides, and 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 a lot of this has been because of climate change as well. So so a, ha a high um, exposure to natural hazards has threatened uh, the sustainability of a lot of our social problems as well. So so I think uh, with those, um, I I think uh, those are the the top in my list. You read from time to time, even in the American press, that um, that these the, the climate change factor you just mentioned also affects the productivity of the coffee production regions, regions of Guatemala, which are one of the cornerstones of the economy, right? Definitely. I mean, coffee rust and, and, and the productivity of the of the coffee industry, that's one of our main, you know, um, uh, products. It's it's totally been, um, you know, it's been worse, a worse situation for the for the people who are in that industry that a lot of them are really small coffee farmers in the highlands of Guatemala, and and you know it, it's been terrible for them. Yeah, Guillermo, uh, what about uh, Honduras? What's your perspective in terms of why why are people attempting to leave Honduras? Hi, hey, Matt. Thanks for the invitation. Um, I think uh, I'll start with uh, a, a, more, a tendency that's larger than Honduras, which is a, the international migration tendency uh, that we see um, you know, going through Honduras as we, when, uh, when groups of migrants uh, are being detained here, uh, there's not only the Hondurans that are leaving, but it's Haitians, Brazilians, Africans, um, going through the country, through the region uh, and taking advantage established let's say migration institutions that have been created in these past decades. So it's, um, it, it grows wider than, um, than just what, um, what Hondurans are going through, but it, it definitely adds. Then we have, uh, I'd say, a, a weakening in, uh, in the trust for democratic institutions um, where, where people feel um, that the system isn't delivering what they expect, just as Maria and, and Claudia were saying. Um, then we have a couple of other factors, uh, same for Honduras, that Honduras started the migration cycle uh, some years after Guatemala and El Salvador did. Uh, ours mainly started at the end of the, of the 90s. Um, so now we're going through the reunification of families, um, which, which is, you know, some of these family members that left 15, 20 years ago are now bringing in their sons, daughters, nephews, or even grandkids. Um, the, the economic weakness, which basically uh, can be said, Honduras hasn't, hasn't reached a 4% growth uh, in GDP in several years. Uh, for things to get better here, we need to be at least over a 7% growth for a decade. Um, and then we have uh, an issue that we'll say it's um, highly limited upward social mobility. Uh, and it's the, the lack of hope that if you do things right, uh, you can move up in life. So I think that uh, that's a huge factor that feeds into the last part, which is um, which has been a lot in the U.S. media uh, with unaccompanied minors. Uh, and this goes for um, in, in three main categories. It's those young and unemployed. 
It's those that are attending attending school and feel the schools aren't delivering or are simply not attending schools uh, or, or university. Um, and, uh, and then you have those in urban areas, which as mentioned before as well, are, are living in the danger of being recruited by these juvenile gangs. That, that sort of compromises um, or, 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 or all of these categories live under the unaccompanied minors uh, in migration. Thanks. Are there are there special factors that pertain to San Pedro Sula, where where you live and work, uh, with that are different from Tegucigalpa, or is it is it all, all the same? I I would say um, the difference is that the government is in in town, uh, so uh, government jobs or being part of the government bureaucracy isn't 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 a big of an industry to work in as it would be in Tegucigalpa. Um, so when um, I think you know, we'll we'll touch later on the effect of of uh, climate change or the um, or the storms uh, when when uh, you get hit when the economy gets hit in San Pedro. Uh, you feel that at a national level, and it takes much longer to uh, restart uh, jobs in the private sector than it, than it can sometimes in the public sector. Thanks. So there's a lot of overlap in those in those lists. Um, so let's just go a couple of levels down. One common factor that I heard all three of you mention is the general concern about governance and the rule of law. So talk to us a little bit about what efforts are underway in your country to address uh, these weaknesses and what more might be done. Claudia? Okay, let me, let me say that uh, in, in the theme of rule of law and good governance, I think that El Salvador is currently backsliding in a very dramatic way. Um, basically what happened, um, I know that maybe some of you've heard on May the 1st, uh, our president, President Bukele, gained control of the National Assembly with his super majority in the legislative branch. Basically, he replaced uh, magistrates of the Supreme Court without um, disregarding, uh, I mean, disregarding constitutional procedures. They also removed the Attorney General and appointed a lawyer with a background that is very, very, um, questionable. The armed forces right now are under his grip and so is the national police. So what you can perceive regarding good governance right now is basically um, that in El Salvador, it isn't about rule of law anymore, but rule of a strong man. And this has a very important repercussions because uh, Maria said uh, a little while ago, um, to my, uh, she phrased it in another way. I'm, I'm retaking some words of a Mexican uh, many years ago saying, to my friends, anything. To my enemies, the power of the law. So I think that right now in El Salvador that has basically the separation of powers has been eroded in such a dramatic way. And this rapid consolidation of power basically is putting in danger our, our stability. And this could also in time, not at this moment, create another wave of migration. So I think it is very regrettable also how in a matter of weeks, El Salvador's relationship with the United States has been deteriorating in a very um, dramatic and uh, way, knowing that uh, the United States has been our strategic ally. Not only, as I mentioned before, uh, having a very important part of our population living in the United States, but also sending remittances that constitute around 20% of our GDP. But I would like to go back on some of these themes. Um, before I, I, um, not, I stop talking, I just wanted to comment on something that someone mentioned. And what does literacy mean? And I think that also this culture of rule abiding citizens, you know, that people that 
the rule of law is an important part of our daily lives. I think that we've had a very problematic way in the sense that in our countries, I don't think we've done a good job um, with education on civic values. What does it mean to be a Salvadorian? What should we expect of our public figures? And unfortunately, um, transparency, good governance, um, accountability have not been in the mix. Thank you. Uh, Maria, what, 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 what kinds of things are Guatemalans doing to try to address the issues of, of, uh, of weak rule of law and governance? And what, what more do you think could be done? Well, um, I have to say as Claudia, <clears throat> that in Guatemala, we've, we've also backlashed for, for, for this, you know, such an important thing in our, in our reality. I mean, we, we came um, from, from having a, as you see, of, of having right now, you know, a, a very deficient government in terms of, of, of you know, fighting uh, impunity. Um, what happened is in, in, in 2000, just for the people that, that, that are not very familiar with this, uh, in 2006, I think, um, you know, the United Nations and Guatemala government uh, agreed to create this special commission um, to fight uh, impunity and corruption. Uh, for its signals in Spanish, it's called CC, it was called CC. The commission was a totally independent body without checks and balances. And that's something that we really have to learn from this, from, from, from what happened in, in Guatemala in the last years. Um, this unity, the special unity work really closely with uh, Guatemalan prosecutors, especially with this um, office called La Fesi, which is an, a unity specializing um, in terms of impunity to, to, to fight impunity and corruption. And um, last government uh, under President Morales' presidency, uh, they decided not to extend the mandate and to cease the commission's operations. I think it was September of 2019. Yeah, just right before you know the pandemic. Um, so, so what happened afterwards? I mean, um, you know, La Fesi is still one of the few institutions in the country that has been continuing with the mission uh, of the now gone CC. Uh, but we really have to admit that when CC was part of our of our system, they, I mean, there was like, I don't know what's like 60 uh, corruption schemes were exposed, you know, implicating officials in all, uh, in all the government and, and, and promoting the resignations of a lot of ministers for the first time. Uh, I mean, we had a, a president and a vice president arrested and, and why do I mention this? Is It's because it really sounds like an FBI CIA movie for us. This has never happened in Guatemala before. And, and, and in the region, it was one of a, one of a kind effort, anti-corruption, anti-impunity um, uh, type of operation. And this brought a lot of unity at the beginning. And, and we have to admit that, you know, everybody was so amazed of what was happening. Uh, the eyes all over the world were on us. And that's something that we can actually feel proud of. Um, but then, uh, you know, at the same time, um, it became a, such a polarized conversation that you, either you were, you know, a processy uh, or you were against um, me or because uh, in the other end, you were a, 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 a processing or you were not an anti-corruption person. So, uh, you know, I'm not gonna get in the subject if I, if I was pro or not uh, CC because of that, because I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a great situation that, that really we had a lot of learnings that we are not putting in practice, uh, definitely. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the FESI right now is, it's by itself. It's not an independent organ. I mean, it's, it's, it's a unity under, under the minister, Ministry of, of Governments, but it has like a special capacities and they've been trying to do the best they can. I mean, to, to, to keep on fighting with the anti-corruption, especially inside our, our corrupted system. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, th those efforts are not enough. I mean, drug trafficking has grown significantly in the country in the past, um, in the past year. Um, I mean, pandemia was, was very important for, for drug traffickers. And again, it's not a matter of, of CSIG or, or FESI or, or this current government. I think it's, 
it's a, it's a matter of I personally think it's it's just a matter that institutions are are not strong or capable right now enough to face the backlash of those being involved. That's the reality. And corruption is so rooted right now in our system that we're not going to be able to 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 you know to have the I don't know the 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 effort that it really has to take to mitigate, for example, migration without without any 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 help without any any i don't know support on on it, to our to our to what we're doing right now um how our institutions can fight corruption i mean drug trafficking and impunity were i mean those three things are part of our system itself that's that's we have to be honest with ourselves if we really have the capabilities it doesn't matter who who is in charge right now uh, of taking the, the really important decisions in our country because it's so rooted that, I mean, whatever plan you have, whatever effort you wanna make, um, it, it's gonna be a really difficult one because, uh, you know, it's, it, it's really, the organized crime is really organized inside our system and our institutions. And, and that's where I don't think we're, we're capable enough to, to keep on fighting. That, that's a real truth right now in, in, in Guatemala. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. I saw the demise of CC take place over the course of two years, and um, I understand the factors that led to that process, but it was unfortunate uh, uh, to to uh, to see that happen. Uh, Guillermo, what about Honduras? What what efforts are taking place in Honduras to try to address the governance issues, and and what more you, could be done? Well, I think Honduras, like a lot of Latin America, suffers from the um, the the Gaudio disease. You know, the we want a strong man, we want a strong leader to fix all of our problems, um, and uh, then when we have that person in power, it's uh, it's easier for them to concentrate power, um, and then we go through the problem of how do we. Uh, decentralize that power once it's done, um, and and I think that's that's one of the cycles that um, our region constantly falls into. And in our case, we are um, sort of at the at the end of a cycle, at least on a downturn of the of the Caudillo cycle, um, where where uh, the campaigns in the you know in the last three four campaigns, it was the strong man who was. Um, promoted uh, or, or trying to win the campaigns. And in fact, that's what the population voted um, in most cases. So uh, that fed into the political system to concentrate power. So we saw that. Um, now, um, we, you know, I, I do want to mention that um, um, the Gua Guatemala City, San Salvador, um, are out of that top 50 most dangerous cities index. Um, this year, and uh, and San Pedro Sula and Tegucigalpa are now in the mid 30s. Uh, after so Tegucigalpa and San Pedro were in the top five, top ten for many years. Now we're uh, we're in the late 30s, uh, and hopefully we'll be out of that index um, with both Guatemala and, and San Salvador by next year or the year after. Which that in that side it says you know things are better. The homicide rates are much better than they were some years ago when uh, when it was complete chaos, uh, and that sort of went with the um, with the the path that uh, Honduras has moved ahead with extraditions uh, for those that were uncontrolled crime bosses, um, and and in this case Honduras has moved um, about twenty five Hondurans uh, or um, foreign nationals have been extradited to the U.S. And this includes not only uh, cartel leaders, but also politicians and also po national police members. Um, so this feeds into the, how the structure, the crime structure in the country was well established. But um, and so th those are good things. But the concentration of power also um, creates other problems um, and and the rotation in, in party politics as we're going now in the three, three governments from the same administration, uh, there is, um, I guess, a natural uh, um, exhaustion that comes from three, uh, three periods from the same party. Um, and we could see a fourth 
which um, you know, which brings other problems or other opportunities. It depends on how how things happen. Um, but I think that building trust in the judicial system, as we know, it takes a very long time. And the problem is with populations with high poverty is that patience is not something that exists um, when you're when you're considering that you're going to make bring food to the table, uh, you know, for this week or for this month. Uh, you have a really hard time of accepting a, a process that can take 10, 15 years to gain trust um, in, in the judicial system. Um, and, and I'd say there's, a, and also with what Maria was mentioning on, on the anti-corruption situation, we saw that happen here as well. Um, but we have to be careful on not turning it into a, you know, semi-religion behavior where we start uh, just doing, you know, just having witch hunts all over the place. Um, and because that just brings less trust to the system, less trust within, within society. Um, and that, and, and um, when we, I think Honduras at least is at a level of uh, lack of trust that our only hope or many people's hope is that justice will come from abroad. Um, and and if, if we only expect justice to come from abroad, we have a very, very serious lo uh, problem locally, which and uh, the best uh, judicial system and the best justice is the one that's brought by uh, your local government or your local, you know, you're within the city, um, not at the national level and definitely not coming in from abroad, which just says that your system has failed. So I think the work needs to be done in into bringing that trust back into our um, judicial and prosecution institutions um, to be able to to have these um, you know move move from the extradition to doing local trials that you can trust uh, and believe that um, that should that should move our institutions and our trust in, in society a long way. Thanks for all those comments. So I wanna uh, invite our listeners uh, as you follow along in the conversation to be thinking about additional questions that you'd like to ask of our panelists. We'll turn to those in just a few moments. Feel free to uh, enter those into the chat and, uh, and we'll get to as many as, uh, as time permits. So all of you have commented on the challenges in the government's governance area that your countries face and the efforts that uh, are underway to try to address those challenges. One thing that has been so uh, heartening and encouraging in working with you and the rest of our Central America Prosperity Project network over the last couple of years is your commitment to your countries and your efforts. Uh, I know Fundesa Fusades and, and Fundacion Elutera each in, in your different ways are committed to uh, overcoming these weaknesses and, and proposing and implementing solutions. And so I congratulate you all on that and thank you for, for that commitment. Let me turn to another one of the common factors that all of you cited, and that is a lack of economic opportunity, and particularly for young people who are emerging from schools and training and finding inadequate job opportunities. Um, talk a little bit about what your countries are doing to foster more robust job creation uh, and what else might be done. Claudia? Yes, um, so I have a story to tell you. <laughs> A, a bad one and a good one. So I'll start with a bad one. I met this um, this very, you know, this guy full of life with a beautiful smile. Um, he was raised in our beachfront by a father that took care of a property. And so he was a great surfer and his father gave him a great education. He became a computer engineer. One day I go back to the beach and I didn't find Jonathan and I asked what had happened to him. So the gangs had tried to recruit him. He was so afraid because he was told that they would follow him and he didn't want to go home. It took him a while, but basically he went to live to the United States. He walked all the way from El Salvador to the United States. And can you imagine that this guy that was a computer engineer right now is working at building homes somewhere in the, in the West Coast. So I believe that if we don't do something, we're just having 
a lose-lose situation because we're losing good Salvadorians that could be staying here. And this is where I connected with the happy story. Um, so, well, Fusales is uh, a very big think tank and we keep doing studies and what can we do to promote, um, you know, prosperity, economic growth. Um, and we, uh, in fact, because uh, with the Bush Institute, we have been really searching what can we do to enhance the digital agenda. So I had uh, the opportunity to go and search around what we were doing regarding government, but also private sector. And I met um, this company uh, representatives, Applaud the Studio, which I think it's a very, um, you know, it's, it's a case of, of hoping. What they do is that they build tech solutions. And right now they're doing mobile applications, let's say for, for the MBA, for the Miami Heats, for, I mean, and so they're nearshoring um, selling Salvadorian services to companies abroad. So they have already been investing uh, with Código, it's another company, $1.5 million in programming training. Right now, they've trained 1,500 Salvadorians and they will be very eligible for the job market. But the good part is that they don't have to go anywhere. They can work from their computers in their homes, not having to leave our country. And we can promote the Salvadorian dream living here with their families and with a, a job that right now is paying four times more than uh, the, the minimum wage, uh, monthly wage in El Salvador. So I really believe that we have great opportunities here because uh, Matt, I, will, I wouldn't want people, you know, sometimes when I, because I have a heart with rule of law. So, you know, I'm always very, very uh, worried and sad with what's happening in El Salvador. But we must also believe that we have good stories to tell. And just one other comment, Glasswing. Glasswing is this very big NGO that works regionally. And it's about, you know, cultivating, um, being a, a good society, addressing the root causes, what's happening because of the violence and the pro poverty, uh, strengthening um, the, the public systems, but also addressing the trauma issues because our mental health in so many communities has been um, seriously damaged in it with all this violence. So we also need to start talking about these other issues because they're also structural and they, they make you have such level of despair that sometimes people actually, they just wanna run away. Yeah, uh, thanks, for, thanks for highlighting the digital agenda. Um, Maria, talk a little bit about uh, efforts that are underway in Guatemala to try to promote greater job opportunities for young people. Yeah, okay, well, um, Pandemia also brought good things to Guatemala. I have to admit that um, right now there, there is this uh, plan that it's in, this, in the strategic phase right now. Um, it's called Guatemala Moving Forward, and it's the first of its kind in the country where the private and the public sector are working conjunctly to, to actually have a plan to strive to boost the, um, the ecosystem responsible for attracting uh, foreign direct investment, focusing on exports and stronger institutions as well. So, um, well, how to accomplish this really robust plan? We have to obviously stable a, full, uh, a flow of uh, foreign direct uh, investment at scale in order to attract um, as a catalyst for economic growth, it requires a lot. A, a lot changes in, in mainly five different pillars, which if my mind doesn't, doesn't go uh, uh, to another place, I think it's infrastructure, which that means uh, all that has to do with transportation, logistics, 
uh, public service, such as uh, energy um, and social infrastructure, such as you know hospitals, for example. Um, another pillar, really important pillar is the economic sectors, which uh, focuses on the domestic market, housing and, and commerce. Um, the other one is exports, making you know more of what we do good and diversifying our, our, our current competencies and, and broadening horizons into a more sophisticated fields. Um, another one is you know competition and, and, and secure investments agenda. What does it take to do that? And, and, and there are specific tasks for that. And, and another one is um, an institution to attract and promote foreign direct investment. So, so I'm really happy that this is actually going on right now in Guatemala. Uh, we just, uh, this is in the private sector, is Fundesa, the, the, the organization responsible for working this with the government. So, so I'm actually part of Fundesa and, and I feel really proud because we've done a, a terrific effort to, to hire uh, uh, this international uh, consultancy firm to help us, you know, make it real. And, and that's what we're doing right now. And um, I think it, it's going to translate into strategies that are going to attract um, foreign direct investment in the sense that we're going to make more of what we do good. And, and I think that's that's recognizing our strengths. If, if we do a SWOT analysis, who are we good at? And, and diversifying, you know, those things that, that the market is, is, is asking for more. And, and trying to see if Guatemala can supply that into a, into and, and be a global player as, as many countries, um, sort of what, what Claudia was mentioning um, uh, just just a few minutes ago. And the other one is is how to you know leapfrog into more sophisticated sectors. The digital one, I mean, it's not because I work in the digital sector, but I think there's a huge opportunity nowadays. I mean, this whole pandemia uh, 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 year. We, we we not just embrace digital, but what we made we made it part of our lives, and and we saw how technology can improve, you know, the life of of, of people, no matter their social status or their economic possibilities. So I think if we actually uh, make this plan happen and, and work really closely with the aim of of, you know, giving this boost that it's really needed in our economy right now, I think it's going to be a, a really good. Um, thing that's going to happen in, in, in the next months. Yeah, that's, I think it's very promising. And so for everyone's information, both Claudia and Maria have mentioned the digital agenda that the Bush Institute has been promoting in, in these three countries over the last two years. And I just want to say, um, when we brought the Central America Prosperity Project Working Group together two and a half years ago, we posed an open-ended question. We said, why don't those countries produce more job opportunities and what should we do? What can be done about that? And it was the idea that digitization, promoting digitization of the economy would be a cornerstone reform that would have implications for all these challenges we've discussed, transparency, rule of law, uh, corruption, and attracting investment and creating job opportunities. That idea came from the working group, you all, uh, not from us. And, and we've been delighted to support the efforts that the group has undertaken in the intervening couple of years to promote that idea. We've been very been delighted to see the amount of progress that's been made on legislative and regulatory reform in all three countries to promote digitization with a view toward promoting the competitiveness of those countries and also regional economic integration, which is one of the keys to making those markets uh, more attractive as a, as a location for investment. So before we turn to uh, questions from the audience, and I'm delighted to see a number of very interesting and useful questions from the audience, let me just uh, ask you, Guillermo, to talk a little bit about the issue of job opportunity and investment and, and what's what's being done in uh, Honduras to try to uh, overcome that issue. Well, I think um, I'll start with uh, when political instability uh, in, a, in an economy the size of Honduras um, has a, a large direct impact. Um, and we've seen for the last five years or so a decline in foreign direct investment, a steep decline. Um, and that has come um, as a factor partially on, on corruption, partially on global economic trends, uh, and partially on uh, the weakness on, in the institution uh, that in democratic institutions that came 
after the um, the re-election of the current administration. Um, as you know, for those that that, that don't follow Honduran politics, we had our first re-election process in which wasn't fully within our uh, legal system, um, and that created a big um, parting ways between if um, between the opposition and those that um, that back the government. So um, these this these past four years, although we have advanced in security issues, um, the economy hasn't had the growth and the, and the confidence needed for strong economic growth. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, if, if you fix the security issue, um, you, people still need to have a better quality of life and people do want to uh, send their kids to better schools or, you know, or have better jobs. So if that, that, that doesn't happen in an economy that barely grows, that grows at the pace of population, um, and th that gives a lot of the incentive to, to leave because um, it's not only the migrants that reach the southern border of the U.S. on foot or on or, or driving that um, that where the migration happens, but there's a large professional migration which is moving not only to the U.S. but it's moving to Europe, it's moving to Canada, in particular to Canada. Um, is, is where the uh, professional migration is heading to because of, so, of um, uh, migration policy that the U.S. sorry that Canada has uh, different than the U.S. for for professionals. Um, so it's it's across the board. Even well-educated uh, Hondurans have trouble looking or, or finding jobs that satisfy what they what they think are their professional needs, um, and they look they look abroad. Um, that is is uh, strictly tied to the lack of economic growth um, and economic activity. So it's, um, it's not only, it's the secure, saying security is the cause um, is an oversimplification of the problem, but it's one that really uh, the, the US media picks up the, the most. I think it's the easiest one to, to, to relay while um, a positive social mobility or upward social mobility is a bit harder to explain. Um, but um, what have we been doing? Well, uh, in the past six, seven years, we've done, uh, we, we've changed some rules in the, um, in the labor code to allow for more fl a, fl a more flexible rate labor code that has not delivered all of the, the um, benefits that we wanted because it isn't a fully flexible system. Um, we still have one of the worst labor codes in Latin America, which, uh, which pretty much puts it in one of the worst in, in, uh, in the world, I think. Um, so, and, and changing these labor, labor codes are very tough democratic processes, uh, which, which are, are hard to change um, and uh, we just haven't been able to. Uh, I don't think that the, the system, every time you try to touch the labor code, um, uh, protests and, and riots break out. Um, it, so there, there has been a change into, into these new economies. The government has been interested in moving into what you know what they're calling here uh, after Colombia. Colombia uh, sort of named it that, and then the IADB, the the orange economy, which is the digital economy. Um, but the interest, just having the interest, isn't enough. You need to do um, structural changes that haven't happened. And uh, some of those go for, from simple things like um, changing um, how you manage your accounting for a digital business in the, in the local tax code. Uh, the tax codes need to be upgraded. Um, the way on, you know, if, if I sell services abroad, do I have uh, currency controls also that, and so it's current, so, so the, the monetary policy needs to be changed also for these global businesses that can, that they don't have to be big, but in order to participate, in order to, to provide services for some of the large technology firms from the US, you don't need to be huge. You just need to be able to do it. And, uh, and if the system doesn't adapt itself, then you end up being forced to work in the informal sector, even though they're pretty decently paying jobs. So it's not only the informal sector is only is only for the bottom of the pyramid. Um, so there's there's those are some of the structural parts that that need help. We've looked at pilot programs such as special economic zones, which uh, get a lot of push also, um, even though they're legal and have started to operate 
there's there's still uh, pushback uh, from not understanding or people being worried about um, if these uh, zones break up um, our current system, which all we know is a weak system to start with. But uh, um, pilot projects happen. Um, we we haven't been able to qualify for a Millennium Challenge account uh, funds. Let's say in the US, I, I see there's some questions on that. Um, we haven't qualified because of corruption or not complying with uh, several of these index of the uh, indexes that allow into these funds for um, something like you know 10 years or so. So um, there, there's a lot of structural work that needs to be done in order to fix the problem and really open the economy. We tried during these uh, these months of or these past 14 months during the, the pandemic to uh, to change several legislations uh, regarding digital government, uh, simplifying bureaucratic processes, which have successfully gone through Congress. Um, but there's a lot that still needs to be done. Yeah, thank you for all those comments. So we got a bunch of really interesting questions from our audience. Let me turn to a couple of those. Um, one uh, for each of you, I think, is um, talk a little bit about the role of gender inequality uh, in driving any unequal access to job opportunities and contributing to emigration. And, and this is a topic that has uh, come to interest us at the Bush Center over the last number of months as we started to think about gender-based violence as a potential driver of uh, encouraging particularly women and girls and children uh, to leave those countries. So uh, Claudia, let, let's just make another quick round. Claudia, can you comment on that topic from the point of view of El Salvador? What about gender inequality and gender-based violence? Yes, um, basically there's a little bit more than half of our population that are women. Um, and unfortunately in El Salvador, according to UN uh, women, 67% have suffered some type of violence, but only 6% report it. In fact, we have one of a very high um, uh, rate of deaths, it's more than 13 uh, over 100,000 women. That's one of the highest in the world. So I, I totally believe that this is an issue that we should uh, be addressing. Um, it isn't only that women don't have um, the economic opportunities because that is also uh, uh, an issue that in fact we could I, I, I really, I feel very, very, very touched by the theme of economic empowerment for women. But I think that this morning, finally, I, I mean, I, I am very, very frustrated because during this week, we've been having very um, horrible news around the issue of, of women and violence. Um, some data was just released saying that during the first three months of this year, there were 1,500 births, births in girls and adolescents, adolescents between 10 years old and 19. I mean, imagine teen pregnancy uh, adding up to the cycle of poverty and, um, and not having the, the trust on the system. I think that that is an issue that should be addressed. But um, I would also like to thank the United States because uh, it, with USAID money, we were able to um, create the criminal prosecution policy on violence against women. And um, it still needs to, be, I mean, right now we have the policy. We have the, the special 911 number, but it needs to be used and that it also requires more education and trust on the system. And also that the institutions like the general attorney's office, like the judges really are there because it takes a lot for a woman to denounce the violence. And, and um, if then the system doesn't provide justice, it adds up to what I was saying about frustration. And that is why more uh, women and children are uh, migrating. 
Thank you. Yeah, that's an important factor. Maria, would you like to comment on that question from the Guatemalan perspective? What's the role of gender inequality and gender-based violence in, in driving immigration? Yeah, I mean, definitely. If I start, you know, just saying all these facts and figures about gender inequality, it's just going to sadden me more of, of what I'm horrorized with the situation right now. But I have to talk also about the success stories and what's proven to make a difference in this just so important matter as gender um, um, inequality. I'm vice president right now of an organization which it, it stands for Maya, Maya, but not as an M A. Um, uh, YA, you know, M A I A, Maya School. And um, this particular school in Guatemala is the first female indigenous led school, a uh, secondary high school um, school in Central America that offers a holistic education. That's that's something that we haven't tried before in our in our in our education system right now. It's just focused on academics, you know, and 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 that's not the answer for all the inequality uh, problem that we're facing right now. So with the with this holistic educational approach, uh, we focus obviously on equality. Um, at the same time that we focus on academics, we focus also in culture and identity, on socioeconomic, also say emotional. Uh, development on family engagement on the community of the girl you know on a lot of other things that we haven't had the chance to incorporate it in our national um, education system so these girls we call them pioneer girls their their first language is their native um, language their second language is spanish or english and and that's a capability that it's you know it's really helping them to, you know, I mean, take advantage of a lot of so many opportunities that girls are, are not being able to, to, to take advantage before just because they're limited to education that their families, you know, can, can afford to them just for the sake that, that they're really vulnerable families. You know, I talked to you uh, at the beginning of, of of um, of this uh, of this um, of this event about you know the, the the problem of coffee the problem of uh, they have to face so many problems that um, at the end the girls uh, since they're really little they're they're being you know just a not privileged with having education so so definitely I mean Guatemala I think it's a 112th rank in the gender inequality index worldwide we're we're terrible in that. But we really need to think about what's what's really working because we really need to find solutions. We really have to disrupt what's what's being done for the for the last I don't know how many years, and that obviously you know clearly hasn't worked. So so yeah, I mean we have also good stories about programs and and and, and organizations that are giving a lot of hope to to many Guatemalans and an example for what has to be done as well. Thank you. That's that's a great uh, initiative, the Maya School. I appreciate you bringing it forward. That's a wonderful uh, kind of indigenous initiative. So we're approaching the bottom of the hour, uh, and we want to we want to end promptly at twelve thirty out of respect for our listeners' time. We appreciate everybody's attention. Guillermo, let me give you a, an opportunity to to comment on the gender inequality, gender based violence issue with the, from the perspective of Honduras, and then we'll turn to a final round. Well, I think the, the the case is very similar as as in Guatemala and El Salvador um, within regarding gender-based um, violence and, and and inequality in the in the uh, workforce. Um, but I would, you know, I think it, you know when when we just break it up under um, gender, I think we st we 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 go away from probably which is the biggest problem in Honduras, which we're going under the our main population boom right now. Um, and we have we're at the point where we have the largest young population of work and age population in the country that we will ever ever have. Uh, and we're losing it uh, on migration, on lack of hope, on violence, um, or just because they're not inserted into the formal market. Um, so when we when we have that large section of 15 to 35 uh, boys and girls, men and women, 
uh, that do not have a place of a place in the economy where they feel happy. That's also where we see the largest unemployment part of, of the population. And that's and that's very close to the same percentage that we see. Um, so 70 percent of that population, the 1535, is unemployed or doesn't have a full time um, uh, income opportunity. Um, but that's also very close to the number of 70 percent of of, uh, of the migrant population reaching the U.S. is also between 15 and 35. Uh, so we're we're missing a, a large population that's just leaving right now that should be um, should be helping to boost the economy, similar to what happened in Korea when they had their population boom. Uh, see when when that population was brought in. Uh, South Korea was able to, to grow their economy to levels where they became a, a, a first uh, world uh, or a mature income uh, country within a very short time um, uh, and coming from very similar conditions where, where Honduras was. So um, I don't want to put down the, uh, the gender question, but I think our, our when we see is, is, is that it's both uh, opportunities in the workforce for for that under 35 population, which is huge, and that also has a big impact in uh, how uh, democracy works for the next couple of decades, um, and and if it will work um, locally. Yeah, I think I appreciate you bringing forward the demographic point because I think that's a, an underlying push factor. In this the, in all three countries are experiencing or the. A, a, broadening demographic, expanding demographic uh, uh, base, which I think drives a lot of uh, a lot of that force for migration. So uh, we have a number of additional questions from from members of the audience. I think some of them have been touched on directly or indirectly. One one questioner asked why immigration immigration has continued even as violent crime has declined. I think Guillermo touched on that in the sense that you pointed out that economic opportunity has a lot to do with driving immigration, even in the absence of violent crime. I think it was also you, Guillermo, who, who alluded to the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Uh, one of the questioners asked about the, the lasting impact of Millennium Challenge goals in, in countries that did have Millennium Challenge compacts, which I believe both El Salvador and Guatemala had, uh, have had Millennium Challenge compacts. And then another questioner asked, uh, what steps would you would you welcome from the Mexican government in terms of protecting migrants in transit? So I apologize to not have the opportunity to explore all those questions in great depth. There's a lot here. There's a lot happening in the region, obviously. Uh, and, and as I say, I think we've highlighted today that a lot is being done uh, by leaders in the region to try to address these problems. So our final question uh, that I'd like to ask each to comment on as, as, as briefly as possible is sort of another lightning round. What are the top two or three things that the United States could do in the coming months and years to help reduce the power of the push factors we've been discussing today? Claudia? Well, it's something to connect. Um, I truly believe that the MCC, those kinds of compacts, the governance, the way of the metrics, uh, the way that the countries become uh, responsible and accountable uh, for for their end of the bargain is absolutely fantastic. So uh, I'm sorry we didn't have enough um, time to, to comment on that. But um, let me tell you that I think that I really appreciate this, this um, conversation. And during the, my last words, I would say that I want to use this moment just to say that no matter what El Salvador does with its government, um, the common vision that we've had with the United States, the, the commitment to values, to principles, to democracy, to rule of law, to transparency, that no country like China or Russia can never, can never um, substitute. So what I really want to say is, Keep believing in our country. Um, there's a lot of great people that we're, a, a lot of great people that I know, and we're trying to make democracy and prosperity work in our country. So, just don't um, don't forget about us. <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. 
Uh, Maria? Um, okay, so the United States has a lot to offer right now to the world uh, in terms of expertise, know-how, and what things can we work in conjunction? That's that's one of the, the main things that comes to my mind when you ask what, what can the US be, be willing to do right now in order to, you know, see his migration and help us prosper um, too. So in terms of corruption, um, how do we fight together corruption? Because at the end, obviously corruption is one of the push factors. I don't know if it's by having another special <laughs> unit, another commission, um, but it has to have the proper checks and balances, definitely. There's a lot of expertise and know-how and, and, and we really have to work this in conjunction. It's not, you know, as I told you before, our institutions, uh, you know, corruption is in the heart of our institutions. So, so we cannot do this by ourselves. How can we reform our prison system? You, the US has so much experience in, in having these prisons as, as the way they should be. Um, and I'm a millennial, come on, I have to talk about the, the digital world as well. Um, how do we digitalize, digitalize more our institutions? How can we uh, work in a digital strategy that make us more competitive? How, how can more Guatemalans speak English in order to, you know, to have more developers, more, uh, more of these capabilities that we need in this new century? Definitely, that's something that the US can, gives, can, can, can give us. Uh, how can we embrace technology to not, not to change or to, 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 I don't know, we have to have to think in a different approach. How can we disrupt, that's the word, the educational and the health system with technology? And I think the US has a lot on that. Um, instead of keep fighting it, the same thing with, with, you know, with drug trafficking, that it's another push factor and another corruption problem that we have. Um, the US has a lot of expertise and know-how in that, and we have really to work in a different approach to it. And when I say a different approach, it means not only the supply, but definitely, I mean, also the demand. Um, we have to accept that what we've done, it, it, it hasn't had you know, many changes whatsoever. Narcos have more power in some of our, our countries more than, than even local authorities. So if we don't approach this problem in a two-way situation, um, it's, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna change. I, I believe that, that sending the fish, sending aid, um, obviously it helps a little bit, but, it, but it's, it's never gonna really help with the, with the root causes. I'm a true believer that you have to you know, train people how to fish, but also supervise and give the best tips. Um, and then you know, build a factory of, of, of fish um, together. I mean, that's, that's my main conclusion. Thank you, Maria. So we're past the bottom of the hour. Guillermo, final thoughts? Sure. Uh, well, thanks, Matt. Um, I'd say that um, if, if possible, we need some clear signals from the US uh, regarding our um, election cycles. Sometimes we, uh, you know, we don't really know where things stand. I think that creates confusion. Uh, one of those is uh, the false expectations that came from the change in administration uh, in the U.S., uh, where local, the um, local migration industry said, uh, "Oh, well, you know, go now because the borders are open now with the new administration." That has been something that has been um, sounding a lot here with uh, the migration community, uh, which we know that's not necessarily true. So um, maybe clarifying on on migration signals on what is true and what isn't, um, that should be um, a, a top priority. And I would say in the first specific economic sector, I would invite energy companies and, and investment uh, to look into our new energy market. Since um, ele electricity is one of the main competitive factors for economic growth, um, we have just opened the opportunity for private investment in transmission grids, distribution grids, and, uh, and we're trying to attract efficient and low cost power generation that can help us reduce the cost and increase the, the competitiveness of our, of our economy and bring in some of these jobs that are not only uh, industrial uh, high energy consumption jobs, but also this is the basis for data driven industries that need uh, a stable source of power and permanent source of power that, that, that attracts um, higher paying jobs um, that will also help this um, young population, as we were saying, uh, try to uh, consider staying 
uh, or be happier staying staying in the country. So thanks, thanks for the invitation, Matt. It's been a real pleasure being here. Thank you for those comments, Guillermo. Thanks all three of you uh, for your participation today and for your insights and your very thoughtful comments. I think um, what we heard, what I heard today anyway, was a, a set of uh, complex and common concerns from governance to, to gender equality issues, to uh, investment promotion issues, to uh, issues of electrical power and the cost of doing business in these places. I think there's a great um, to-do list here in terms of uh, issues that have to be resolved in order for more of the people of these countries to find a future in their home countries. I think um, we've also seen a great display from all three of you of commitment to your countries, of a desire to wrestle with these questions, to own these challenges, which are ultimately your country's challenges after all. Uh, and also, I think a very clear uh, set of uh, thoughts directed at the United States in terms how, of how the United States can best help. And so I hope with that to have made a, a constructive a contribution to the conversation that's taking place in the United States over exactly how we can best help. I thank you all for participating today and for helping our audience uh, understand these, these challenges and, and think a bit about the, the question as to how the United States can best help. With that, we'll call the, call the um, session to an end. Thank all of our participants for your participation, for asking your questions. Uh, to the extent that we were unable to address everyone's questions, I hope uh, you'll understand that the time constraint that we that we faced. Uh, Follow-up questions or concerns, don't hesitate to go to the Bush Center website uh, and and send us a send us a note or an email. We're happy to uh, forward follow-up questions to our panelists and answer follow-up questions to the extent that we're able. Uh, and in general, I hope that everyone will find bushcenter.org an interesting and useful resource. Uh, in thinking about the push factors that are at work in Central America, thinking about the proposals that are on the table for addressing them, and thinking about uh, how the United States can most constructively help leaders like the ones we've had with us today who are committed to their countries and to resolving the problems of their countries. So with that, thanks everyone for your participation, and we will uh, continue this work as we go forward. Thanks, Thank you in the audience for your interest. Uh, stay with us. We are committed to this work as you are.